Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. A lot of young people there would come and talk to me about their problems. How art can help in the healing of addictions. And we know that a plan in downtown Lake Charles is gonna look a lot different from a plan in rural East Carroll Parish. A new approach to public education. If you forget history, it has a tendency to repeat itself. The teachings from a time capsule. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But right now, a look at some of the other headlines making news across Louisiana. Governor John Bell Edwards met President Donald Trump in New Jersey Thursday to discuss the state's bipartisan criminal justice reform efforts. The governor says, following the lead of other southern conservative states, we came together to enact sweeping reforms in our state. Ahead of that meeting, Senator John Kennedy sent Trump a letter bashing those reforms. Kennedy says the changes are jeopardizing Louisiana's public safety. Thank you Kennedy was feature me. speaker Thank at this week's Baton Rouge Rotary, Rotary Club. George. He said he has high expectations for the future of America and for Louisiana and had praise for positive results, he says, that have come from President Trump. You can draw your own conclusions. This is America. You're entitled to believe what you want about the president's management style. It's unconventional. I've suggested to him before that tweaking less would not cause brain damage. <laughs> but he hasn't taken my advice and I don't expect him to. The state's chief gambling regulator says three of Louisiana's 15 riverboat casinos are considering moving their properties on shore under a new law passed this year. Ronnie Jones, chairman of the State Gaming Control Board, wants those seeking to move to make capital improvements that bolster economic development. Jones says two of the three include the Belle of Baton Rouge Casino and Treasure Chest in Kenner. He also talked about the future of legal sports betting and Louisiana's gaming industry remaining lucrative. We're gambling fools in Louisiana. We've always gambled, even when it wasn't legal, and we still gamble today in areas where it's not legal. So the money is going to be there, the entertainment value is always going to be there, and as long as there's a business opportunity, I think the businesses will be there to take advantage of. Three students from Xavier University in New Orleans are among a group receiving scholarships from actor and comedian Kevin Hart's Help from the Hart Charity. Hart has joined forces with the United Negro College Fund and KIPP, Knowledge is Power program, to help 18 students earn a college degree. Nearly 13 years after Hurricane Katrina laid waste to a landmark brewery comes the announcement of plans to have Dixie beer brewed in New Orleans again. The brand, established in 1907, never left and has enjoyed a resurgence in the city since Saints owner Tom Benson purchased the Dixie Brewing Company last year. Benson's widow, Gail Benson, says the new brewery will be located in eastern New Orleans. Dixie has been made out of state since 2005. As Louisiana's public schools begin to reopen, local superintendents are telling parents to brace for a drop in upcoming school letter grades. They say the state's new tougher rating system will force grades lower and they're worried about the outcry that will come.
And much more about schools now. Class back in session next week for most school districts across the state. Our Kelly Spires spoke with John White, State Superintendent of Schools, about what's new in classrooms this year. So what is, Kelly? That's right. Superintendent White and I spoke about challenges students are facing in the upcoming year and what new plans are in place to help kids overcome those hurdles. The biggest change is called the Every Student Succeeds Act. Louisiana's plan to comply with the law was approved last year. Louisiana was also one of the first states approved uh, under the Every Student Succeeds Act, which requires states to have a plan required by Congress that identifies struggling schools, and not just struggling schools, but also groups of students within schools who are struggling. The Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, is a federal law that replaced No Child Left Behind. The biggest change is that ESSA places more authority at the local level, rather than No Child Left Behind's federal top-down approach to curriculum. White says there are 14,000 school boards across the country. Congress had pretty much dictated exactly how school improvement will happen in every single one of those schools. They've changed that. They said, let's let the states work with the district on plans that are customized to that setting. But at the same time, let's require that the state approve each of those plans. And we know that a plan in downtown Lake Charles is going to look a lot different from a plan in rural East Carroll Parish. I mean, there are different parts of the state. They have different challenges. They have different resources. And the plans are going to be different. But ESSA doesn't sacrifice accountability. School ratings will depend more on standardized test improvement rather than test scores themselves. And one way of looking at LEAP results is how did we do relative to last year? And in some areas, we did quite well. For example, on social studies, uh, which our state has really put an emphasis on over the last couple of years, we saw really strong gains. And that, that's good to see. We've raised the bar in social studies. Kids need to do more writing in response to what they read, more analysis. And we're seeing schools step up. Other areas continue to challenge students. In math, uh, we're still seeing stagnant results. We, we did not improve over last year. And when you look at the national results, when you just observe our schools, when you understand the shortages of highly qualified math teachers, you understand that math is an area where we as a state are struggling. Under ESSA, each school will have their own plan to achieve test improvement goals. And they're going to be required to submit plans to the state to say, well, this is how we're going to have a high quality curriculum. This is how we're going to train the teachers to use that high quality curriculum, how we're going to prepare and make sure we have qualified educators in our school so that we can address the needs of that specific group of students. We're about to launch this process. We've seen hundreds of high quality plans across the state. And the question will be, do we see progress in those schools? Louisiana is making some unique changes in the realm of standardized tests. Standardized tests are important. They allow us to assure families that uh, we're doing an adequate job of, of equipping their young people, their children, with skills. But at the same time, they need to change, too. They need to evolve with the times, too. Five schools will be the first in the nation to pilot an innovative way to measure reading comprehension. Typically, on a standardized test, students will be given a paragraph to read and will have to answer questions about that paragraph. Well, what if the paragraph is about something a student has never encountered before? Say, it's about Paris. Well, think about never having been to Paris, think about never having heard of Paris, think about having no idea what France even is, versus think about someone reading it who spent a year living in Paris, or who took a vacation to Paris, or whose mom or dad went to Paris. Well, of course, you're going to be able to read that passage better if you've had greater exposure to the actual subject. And unfortunately, we know that low-income people, just by virtue of not probably having the means to go to Paris or to do a wider variety of things, their children are going to be disadvantaged on those tests. Instead, students will know what the paragraph will be about, books they've read in class. If you want to create a fairer demonstration of how well a child can read, tell them what they're going to be actually talking about when we test them. Which books are we going to be talking to them about? So rich or poor, South Louisiana, North Louisiana, any parish, any zip code, every child comes into the test with a fair basis for the knowledge that's going to be measured. Improve test scores, improve skills, it's all with the goal to improve a student's success in developing a career or being college ready. So the department is also urging schools to help students fill out financial aid forms for college. Louisiana made more gains this year than any state in the country in terms of the completion of financial aid forms and finished first in the nation in terms of the percentage of young people who graduate from high school having completed a financial aid form. And what that means is more young people than ever before 
are going on. They're getting TOPS, they're getting other financial aid, and they are getting another step in education. The workforce of today, the citizenry of today, society today demands an education after high school. Louisiana's kids are more equipped than they've ever been before to get it. Kelly, thank you for that report. Back to school resources can be found on the department's website at louisianabelieves.com. We were reminded about the statue of that Confederate Army leader, General Beauregard, this week because of a time capsule. The content, contents of that time capsule, buried 105 years ago, continue to make news. It was opened a week ago, and this week the items continue to be inspected. For more than a century, an historic collection of goods lay hidden underneath the statue of PGT Beauregard near City Park in New Orleans. When the statue was taken down a year ago and the base removed last month, this copper box filled with relics revealed itself. Demolition crews doing their work discovered it. A card inside the box shows the date it was buried, November 14, 1913. City Park let us know that they had reason to believe it was under there. And when they removed the pedestal uh, that Bargard was on, uh, and located, they contacted us and turned it over to us because even though the story was that it was there, um, there's been uh, stories of, of capsules being in places and then they, they were never found. So it's pretty incredible that they thought it was there, it was there, and then we were able to retrieve it. Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser joined a curious crowd of media at the State Museum storage facility in the French Quarter as restoration experts began carefully removing the waterlogged items. A gash on one side of the box meant trouble for anything inside from the earthy elements. Yeah, in Louisiana, everything gets wet. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't have the ability to seal things like we do today. Uh, and hopefully, uh, if we retrieve another box, as we talked about, possibly that was under Jeff Davis, uh, we'll be able to, uh, uh, hopefully that box will be better sealed and the contents will not need uh, the repair. First thing is to open it out as much as we can to document it in its current condition and then decide uh, we'll probably do treatment as condition and then treatment assessments so that everyone will know exactly what we have, what state it's in now, and what is our professional opinion on what needs to be done to preserve it for the future. As an archivist and the leader in this respect, uh, it gives dimension to uh, the office that you hold. We will take, preserve it, hopefully to get the items uh, that can be displayed in some kind of fashion that we can put them on display at the Cabildo. Obviously this box had water intrusion. Uh, it's going to take some time to repair those items in the best way they can be displayed. What was uh, one thing that interested you the most that you saw? Well my father uh, collected coins and we had a chest of coins that once a year he'd go through and, and, and make sure they were all there and tell us how he got the, the dollar bill stamped to Y when they thought Japan was going to invade Hawaii. All these incredible stories around these coins that he had collected. So when I saw the sheets of money and the coins, it brought back a lot of memories of the old coins my father used to have and go through, uh, many of them that I have today. So I uh, made that a little personal. Also personal for many will be what filled the small box. Tokens from a rebel government defeated almost 50 years before. Fragments of flags, a large Confederate flag and smaller American flag, corroded war medals, newspapers, yellowed antique currency, including a sheet of $5 Confederate bills issued by Louisiana dated October 1862, a year after the Civil War began. Some of the pieces of history may have great value, but for many, these symbols of the Jim Crow era will certainly stir emotions of pain. Nungesser hopes their revelation will not reignite the controversy about the four major Confederate monuments removed from prime locations in the Crescent City. Hopefully, uh, we can restore these artifacts and keep them to remember history, because if you forget history, it has a tendency to repeat itself.
On this day in 1967, hundreds of civil rights activists set out from Bogalusa to trek 105 miles in the August heat to the capital in Baton Rouge. What made this march stand out from others across the South is that it was completely nonviolent. Louisiana Public Broadcasting took a look at the event in its Louisiana A History series, produced by Tika Loudon. Louisiana escaped the kind of racial violence that ripped through other places in the South. But the state endured more than its share of conflict nevertheless. Some of the worst clashes occurred in the mill town of Bogalusa in Washington Parish, a stronghold of the Ku Klux Klan at that time. I think the Klan's had more power over the whites than they did the blacks, because the uh, blacks were determined to go ahead and do what they were going to do. White community leaders tried to ease racial tensions there by appointing blacks to the sheriff's department. Extremists replied by sending a deadly message. They followed us about a mile and a little better down the road, and we turned left, and when we got to the railroad track, they opened fire. And it was a rash of bullets. And O'Neill said they're shooting at us. And about that time, he was hit. One of the town's deputies was murdered, and the crime remains officially unsolved to this day. I don't think it was just, say, me. It was the job they're shooting at. They thought a black person shouldn't have a job like that. That, that was my way of thinking because we hadn't did anything to anybody. While Bogalusa had been the site of racial violence, the town eventually offered a sign of more peaceful times to come. Led by Reverend A.Z. Young and other civil rights activists, citizens marched from Bogalusa to Baton Rouge in 1967. With leadership from Governor John McKithen, peace prevailed. All of that was pretty much due to McKithen holding the holding the trouble down and telling state police, you will uphold the law. And uh, so you have to give that to McKithen. He was a civil rights governor. He asked me how I stood about civil rights. I said, we're attempting to conduct ourselves in Louisiana now where we don't need anyone from Washington to tell us what we've got to do. We're moving out as fast as we can and bringing the Negro citizens of our state in the mainstream of Louisiana life. The masterful political move that John McKithen made in the whole Bogalusa March was is that he brought in state troopers and he convinced the blacks that it was to protect them and he convinced the whites that it was to keep the blacks in line. The Civil Rights era was an extraordinary time in Louisiana history. At long last, the people of the state had begun to bridge the bitter divisions between blacks and whites that had existed since the founding of Louisiana. You felt very badly about some of your own family members, some of your social friends uh, not understanding the, the true movement and uh, the essence of every citizen having a right to participate in their government and uh, to live uh, in, in a world economically uh, that was, was on a par with other people. Uh, and it was a very divisive time. People made speeches and said things they shouldn't have said. There was too much emotion there. And when you look back on it, I, I don't know what frightened us so much. And so now so much has changed in that regard. So many people have become better educated. So many people have gone into the professions. And I think this has been a, a, a tremendous change in our state because once people take on roles like this, then uh, the change uh, that comes socially is inevitable. We come full circle. The same place where they made laws against us and all the things they did to us, I'm now able to make a difference, to make a change, to correct what has been done in the past, to show people that you can be a victim, but you can forgive. Remember, you can find more online history with LPB's Louisiana Digital Media Archives at ladigitalmedia.org. 
Lawmakers this week met to discuss funding opportunities that could stem from a lawsuit against more than a dozen prescription opioid manufacturers. Louisiana ranks among the top 10 states for opioid prescriptions. Now, the suit alleges the state has spent more than $650 million for treatment in just the last 10 years. In the meantime, one Louisiana artist has used his addiction and recovery experiences and those of his peers for inspiration in an effort to help addicts see and understand their challenges. First grade, I got interested in art because I won a contest and it was kind of a storytelling piece of work. It's a picture of my whole family in a car going across the Mississippi Bridge. We'd go to Falls River a lot. My family had a camp over there. I got the chance to really study a lot under LSU with Michael Crespo, and then I went and got my master's at Southern, was able to study with Frank Hayden, Gene Paul Hubbard, and Frank Hayden was a big influence on me. I really enjoyed it. I've always enjoyed storytelling in my artwork. I've been in recovery for 29 years, and so I work with a lot of young people that have addiction problems. And I taught at Baton Rouge Community College, was the head of the Baton Rouge Foundation there. And we, um, a lot of young people there would come and talk to me about their problems because they felt safe, they felt that it was comfortable for them to be able to come and tell me the different situations they were having with school, family, and whatever. And so uh, when we had our first art contest or really art show there, the kids kind of challenged me and said, you know, Mr. Peabody, what are you going to do for our art show? And I said, okay, I'll do something. It was about the young people I talked to and their recovery. This was 16 years ago. A lot of the kids were wearing the hooks in their nose and the eyebrows, and they had the tongue rings and everything. So I kind of made, I guess, fun and jest of them and had fish hooks all in part of the face. But then it also has items in there, you know, that back then you could buy something for five bucks. They could get a hit for five bucks. So it's got the five dollar bill. They were a lot of times in total denial that they had the problem. And so that's one of the things whenever you ask them, it's, oh, no, it's not me. It's my friends got the problem, not me. And then over time, I'd have people that would actually come over here and tell me about different drugs because I was not really familiar with all of them with this day and age. They're changing every day. We have something different. And so they would come over and tell me about them, and I'd make a piece so that I could kind of talk to other people about it. And what this has done is really opened a good dialogue for people to come over and look at them and talk to them. A lot of time, people will tell their story, and there's what we call a speaker meeting. They will tell all about themselves from the beginning, what it was like, their recovery was, and then how they're doing in sobriety. And it's interesting to hear them because you hear all the pain, the problems at the beginning, then you start seeing hope, and then at the end you see where they are now clean not using and the life change that they have. So I try to put these in the pieces of artwork I do. And one of them was about the young lady, it's called a chameleon. And she was telling her story and said more or less, she had to be a chameleon. And this, she had to be one way around her parents, one way around her friends, and one way around the drug dealers. And I found this really interesting that that's exactly what she was doing. She was being a split personality and it was eating her lunch having to do that 24 seven. There's another piece about a young man who said he worshiped the alcohol bottle just like you would Bible. And he said he, instead of having a Bible by his bed, he had a whiskey bottle by the bed. And the first thing he'd do in the morning was get up and take a sip of whiskey and had that with him when he would drive, put it in, under his car seat, just like whenever he needed that little hit, he would have it. But he said that's all he did was worship the you know, alcohol. I've asked women to give me one word about their recovery, and these are mostly women who have had more than one or two or three years in recovery. And so they have given me words that what recovery has meant to them. And the words that they use is God's will, they have trust, they have faith, truth, happiness, words that really are, you know, something that means something to them personally. So that's what the piece is more or less trying to reflect. Recovery does really change someone's life for the betterment. And so that's why I've used these 30 words from these people to more or less tell that story. And if you notice also, it had a heart of gold. And we're really trying to get that heart of gold to come back. And that's when we decided we'd put them in a book form 
so that we could actually use it as a tool just to open communication with people who want to be able to talk about addiction in a comfortable way. My work's not limited to addressing addictions. I do quite a bit of other three-dimensional art. And this was a process I learned with Frank Hayden, how to cast like that. So I would cast plaster of Paris cloth in the mold, and then when I pop it out, I have the cast of the fish. And so then from there, I just have a plain white plaster of Paris mold that I then start working on by gessoing and painting and then adding the fins and making stands for them or either putting them in a piece similar that I have on the wall. I paint mostly with acrylic and I use pen and ink and all, but my method's kind of been something I've come up with my own. It's kind of a, I put paint on and then I take it off, I put it on, I kind of destruct to restruct, destruct to restruct. And I like the old patina look on a lot of things, so that's why you'll see a lot of texture and, different colors in my paints because it's layered multiple layers to be able to get to what that effect I have. And I use that effect more than just shading. I like to do that, you know, in my work by being able to put on different layers of paint. I use a technique that I've kind of created where I can remove paint and leave parts of it on and then put another layer on and keep building up where I have four or five or more layers of paint under one surface. This fascinating story comes from LPB's Art Rocks series. It airs Fridays at 8.30 p.m. and Saturdays at 5.30 p.m. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download's free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.